If you can sit still for a couple of minutes, I can show you how to turn that shiny new DSLR into more than just an expensive point and shoot. Hey, Tom here again. Today I'm here to take you through Bucket Castle Photo's crash course in the exposure triangle. This isn't going to be a terribly complicated or even very technical explanation of the exposure triangle. But if you remember from our first episode of Aperture Chat, I talked about working with one of the women in my office at my day job about using her DSLR camera. And that inspired me to make this video, which will just take you very quickly through the different aspects of the, of, of the triangle. Now, the three key points to the exposure triangle are your ISO speed, your shutter speed, and your aperture size. The first part of the exposure triangle we're going to touch on is ISO. When you used to shoot on film, you set your ISO by selecting your film and you couldn't change it mid-roll. ISO was also referred to as your film's speed, referring to how fast the chemicals on the film reacted with light. With the advent of digital photography, it became an option to change your ISO on the fly. Now, everything in the triangle means making a trade-off. For ISO, the trade-off is how clear your final image is. As the ISO speed increases, it becomes a little more grainy. And this is representative of how film works. Film that could capture an image more quickly often had more grain in the finished picture. Now digitally, this is referred to as digital noise, not as film grain. To give you an idea of how your ISO speed affects your picture quality, I've gone and grabbed my old Canon Rebel, which has very drastic changes in the ISO speed as to how it affects picture quality. Now I'm going to put the, the camera straight in the manual so that it doesn't correct for my mistakes. Now, you can see as we turn up the ISO speed to account for low light, how the pictures get grainier and almost to the point of unusability. So in the studio with me today is the wonderful Jessica, who is here to model and she's agreed to let me take horrible pictures of her for the sake of education. So thank you very much for... My pleasure. All right. <laughs> Right now, I'm not going to show you any pictures because they intentionally look really, really bad. Now, the Rebel only does full stop increments. We'll do ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, etc. And as we come up through here, you'll notice you can actually see it mostly in the gray background that you can see the grain of the, you know, of the image as it gets louder and louder to the point where when we hit ISO 12,800 that it's so blown out there's no grain left to see, but the image is basically unusable. Now this can be corrected for in software such as Photoshop or Lightroom or even in camera on many cameras but it turns the picture very fuzzy and very and you lose all your detail so it's not an ideal situation. Alright the second part of the exposure triangle we're going to talk about is shutter speed or exposure time. These terms can be used interchangeably depending on who you're talking to. Now your shutter speed refers to how long the shutter is actually open, and the longer that happens, the more light can hit the sensor and the brighter your picture gets. Now remember, when you're looking into your camera, you're going to see the number that is a fraction of a second. So if you see a 60, that means 1 60th of a second. If you see a 1000, that's 1 1000th one of a second. Now, if you want to go to the other end of the spectrum, you're going to see quote marks that are going to refer to full seconds. So if you see one with a quote mark, that'll be one full second. If you see something that's one quote three, that's one and a third seconds. Now what you're going to notice here as we go through these images starting at one four thousandth and continuing on to two thousandth and one thousandth of a second is that it's just too dark to actually use any of these images even at aperture four or five. Uh, it's, just, it's just too fast. As we get up here into uh, one two hundredth and then one one twenty fifth, one eightieth you can start to see the image. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a 1 60th here. 1 60th is about as fast as you can shoot handheld, uh, and that does give us a usable image, though it's still a little dark. And then as we go past 1 60th, you'll notice there's motion blur, even though we're getting the light we need. And that's just, no matter how great the model or the photographer is, you can't stay still that perfect for that long without a tripod. The last part of the triangle we're going to touch on is your aperture. This is the most complex part of the triangle to deal with, because aperture actually changes two things simultaneously. And it also it adjusts your depth of field as well as how much light gets to the sensor. Now, aperture is written as a fraction. It's f over the aperture number. 
So a larger aperture number actually means a smaller hole. So f22 makes a very tiny hole with a giant depth of field, and something small like f4.5 makes a much larger hole to get light to the sensor, but creates a much more shallow depth of field. What we're going to do is run through the gamut of aperture sizes. Now again, I've put the camera in manual, and I've locked down the ISO and the shutter speed, in this case, we're going to start from the largest number at f22 because that gives us the tiny hole and continue all the way up to f1.8 because this particular lens can go that far out and you can really see the changes. As we shoot with Jessica here, uh, you can see that at f22, f18, that you can't even see anything. The aperture is just way too small. As we move up into f8, you can see Jessica, you can see her there a little bit and then into f6.3 and f4.0, you can really see that she's there. Uh, I had expected as we went past 4 that this would become very blown out, but our light was a little low, dimmer than I expected. So here at f2.0, you can actually see here exactly how I wanted to frame her. Um, I didn't take a shot at f1.8 because, honestly, I forgot as I was shooting this. Well, thank you very much for modeling for me. I, do, I did actually get some good pictures out of this, which I'll be glad to share with you. Hopefully, this will give you a better understanding of what your DSLR ca camera is capable of, besides just being a really expensive, change, changeable lens, point and shoot. Now, a couple of topics we'll cover in future videos include depth of field, which we touched on briefly, in talking about the aperture portion of the triangle and also what all those little things on the dial of your camera mean that will help you use the tools of your camera to affect things like your shutter speed and your aperture without having to go into full manual. So for bucket castle photos this is Tom asking you where does your frame stop? Remember, if you like our videos and you like our podcast, make sure you're subscribed to the Bucket Castle Photo YouTube channel. Also, if you're curious about what's coming up in the future and other events that Ryan and I are going to be partaking in, make sure you check out our Facebook page at Aperture to Pixels Photography. And you can always follow me on Twitter at A2P Photo. Links to all these can be found in the description below.